from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. This is the story of centralized traffic control, an amazing electrical development in modern railroading. Here we have a passenger train speeding westward toward the Pacific coast. And here's an eastbound freight headed for Chicago on the same track. Miles away, the dispatcher can tell at a glance just what is happening. The high precision equipment in front of him advises him of the exact location of every train in his division and he may be controlling operation for as much as 250 miles. His job right now is to get those two trains past each other by using a siding. He sets switches and pushes buttons. And miles away, a switch opens. A signal light changes. The eastbound freight pulling a hundred or more cars at high speed. The watchful engineer spots the warning signal. Speed is reduced. And as he passes the signal, his new position is recorded in the dispatcher's office. The freight takes the siding and moves along at reduced speed. The signals are ready to be reset. Now that the freight is clear of the main line, with a twist of a lever, the dispatcher notifies the speeding passenger train that the track is clear. And here it comes at 80 miles an hour. Thanks to the magic of centralized traffic control, the trains pass. The freight is still moving at slow speed. It has not become necessary for it to come to a complete halt. There goes the westbound. The pass has safely been completed. Now let's take care of the freight. He gets the signal. It's resumed speed. And there goes the freight, back on the main line, eastbound to Chicago. That's centralized traffic control. One man controls traffic on a whole division of a railroad. When you bought your car with its powerful engine, luxurious interior, and beautiful body job, you probably had things like this in mind. The ability to go places and see things, to get around without restriction, to enjoy our beautiful country. But if you drive in our congested cities, you're apt to find yourself in a situation like this. You know, some 50 years ago, an automobile was developed which would go 10 miles an hour. And today, half a century later, that's what some of us are doing 10 miles an hour. And the parking situation, do I need to tell you? You bought your car for convenience, safety, and pleasure. And this is what you're getting. And this is where you're apt to end up. Why? Maybe we've been approaching the problem from the wrong angle. We've been thinking in terms of moving traffic when we should think in terms of moving people. For example, Look at all the cars in this typical downtown block, many of them carrying only one or two persons. All the people in all these cars jamming traffic would fit in just one bus, taking only a fraction of the space. And with all those cars gone, that bus would really get people there in jig time. In a typical city block, one trolley coach affords enough transportation per trip to remove the need for as many as 50 parking spaces. 
And a modern streetcar with its large capacity handles enough traffic each day to remove hundreds of cars from congested downtown areas. A modern high-speed transportation system carries as much traffic as a hundred lanes of automobiles. And short surface trains, often operating along freeways, offer speedy, convenient transportation. Yes, before you start telling how buses and trolleys tied you up driving home, just think of the number of passengers these important transportation systems carry, and think what a complete mess traffic can be when they're not running. They've gone modern in a big way. Two-way radio cars advise dispatchers, enable extra facilities to be put on the streets to solve key traffic situations. And look at this, as an example of how modern a transit vehicle system can be. Your automobile is an important part of your life, as it should be, and will continue to be. And if you believe the problem of congestion can be helped by moving people instead of moving traffic, you'll realize the importance of trolleys and trolley coaches. We Americans are regarded as busy, progressive people. And maybe one of the reasons we get as much done as we do is because we know how to relax, how to take time off from daily problems and just plain have fun. For instance, each year many of us in all sections of the country find sport and relaxation in just fishing. It's hard to describe the thrill of working that reel, knowing you've got a fighting beauty on the other end of the line. And that if you handle your rod right, you've got yourself another fish. Yep, it's hard to describe the thrill, but it's there. Just look at the size of that baby. They always taste better this way, cooked out in the open. There's a real man's meal. Sometimes the neighbors are shy. And sometimes they're as bold as brass. Fishing places run all the way from wilderness to spots where you have to drop your hook after the neighborhood kids go home. Some people fish in lakes. In fact, a lot of folks say it's the only kind. One thing about it, you can get to your favorite fishing spot in a hurry. And some people fix it so they can fish almost off the front porch. Fishing in the ocean is still another kind of fishing and probably one of the greatest friendly arguments of all times goes on between freshwater fishermen and those who go in for the big ones from the briny deep. But the idea is the same, relaxation away from the cares of the world, pleasant companionship, and the thrill of catching that big one. It's a great sport, no matter where you go. You can have the time of your life just fishing. Here are a few famous Americans for you to identify, each of whom has been engaged in projects which have changed our lives. The first one is easy. It's President Theodore Roosevelt, of course. Now, who is the man on the left? This one may be a little harder. Here's a clue. He was the man responsible for one of the biggest construction jobs of all time. By the way, if these pictures look a little old and jumpy, they should. They were filmed clear back in 1914 at the actual opening of this great achievement the Panama Canal. And the man we wanted you to identify was the chief engineer for this project. The man on the left, Colonel George W. Goethals. Who is the man seated at the desk? He's one of America's greatest inventors of all time. And this is regarded as probably the greatest of his many contributions to our way of living. Let's take a closer look. Recognize him? It's Thomas Alva Edison. Here is Mr. Edison with another electrical wizard, the man we'd like you to identify. The man with Edison was a mathematical genius. He obtained patents for over 200 improvements in the field of electricity. He was known as the father of alternating current. He is Charles P. Steinmetz. Now, who is this man? He was a general in spite of that collegiate coonskin coat. He was one of our country's earliest believers in air power 
and caused a considerable furor when he demonstrated a thing like this could happen. Remember him now, General Billy Mitchell. Remember the planes of World War I? And these early crates, we've come a long way since then. And in the last few years, too, here are actual films of the first jet flight in America, October 1st, 1942. People have been experimenting with jet propulsion for a long time, and not always for planes. The principle of jet propulsion is found in Newton's third law of motion, which states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. For example, an ordinary rotary lawn sprinkler turns because of the reaction of the arms and the action of the jet of water. It does not turn because the water squirted out pushes against the air. It would spin just as well in a vacuum. Similarly, a jet plane flies because of the reaction to the jet, not because the jet pushes against the air behind it. The engine itself, with modern developments, consists of two rotating elements. The compressor and the turbine, which are both mounted on a single rotating shaft. Air is drawn in, compressed, and packed into the firing chambers where the fuel is injected. The constantly burning fuel tremendously increases the energy of the enclosed gases which rush through the turbine and out. The turbine operating like a windmill supplies the power to spin the compressor. The expanding gases pushing their way out the rear at about 1200 miles per hour give the plane its forward thrust. This is the heart of the jet engine, the turbine wheel the most tortured piece of metal in the world. It must not twist in the superheated gases. It must not corrode. It must not tear itself apart at 8,000 revolutions a minute. The turbine wheel running red hot is just a few feet away from the compressor, sucking in air that may be 65 degrees below zero. This turbine wheel is an outstanding example of design and craftsmanship. Jet propulsion changed the whole outlook of the aviation industry. Of course, many developments have been made in jet engines. Each new model is more powerful and more efficient than the last one. In one six-month period, three designs were okay, each more powerful than the preceding one. The last of these is no larger than the first, yet delivers so much more thrust that it is not even in the same class. America's scientists and engineers and metallurgists went to work and thanks to them, our country is rapidly achieving a degree of jet supremacy which may well play an important part in our lives in the future. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.